everybody. Welcome back to Roxum TV. Welcome back to our live stream from day two of Law Bitcoin 2024. I'm your co-host Aaron Stanley. I'm back for a couple more interviews here. Joined by Elaine Ramirez. And uh, we're here with Armando Pantoja, who is a futurist and an investor. And he's got a lot of really cool stories we're going to be talking about here today. So uh, Armando, great to have you on the show. Yeah, I'm glad to be here. I'm glad to be here in uh, Brazil, my first time here. Uh, it's a great city, great conference, and I'm very excited to be here on Roxum TV. Very cool, very cool. So, yeah, so maybe uh, give us like the, the quick and dirty on yourself here. You've, you've been in the space for quite a long time. You've had some uh, interesting experiences. What's, uh, how'd you get uh, from, from there to here? Yeah, I've been in crypto since 2011. I got into it by chance. I was at uh, University of South Florida studying cryptology and software security. Uh, my classmates were talking about this thing called Bitcoin, so I got into it early. Uh, and early on, I spent hundreds of Bitcoin. <laughs> Because uh, we, back then we looked at it more as a currency. We thought it was going to be the world's dominant currency, and we spent it because that's what you're supposed to do. It took me until like 2014 or 15 to see the investment potential. Because I was on the tech side, I was on the blockchain, how uh, how you know a transformative that technology was. So I didn't see it as an investment for three or four more years. But once that happened, I started investing heavily in, in Ethereum, heavily in Bitcoin, uh, heavily in uh, some other coins. But that's really the only two I really believe in, XRP also. Uh, and I've been in, uh, you know, a mainstay in the cryptocurrency community uh, for five or six years since 2017. Nice, nice. So you even built an ICO ranker site that you sold off in 2017, is that right? Yeah, in 2017, right. I was also the founder of ICO Ranker, which at the time was the third biggest ICO ranking site on the planet. Like after that, it was hundreds, but at first it was only three. Yeah. You know, it, was, it was ICO Bench, uh, ICO Gold, I believe, and ICO Ranker. Those are the only three on the planet. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. and then we sold it, to be honest, luckily, right before the crash. Yeah, so, good, good timing on that yeah, one. Right? So yeah, so I didn't know that I was in good timing, but I, I was. So. I think I still have like an ICO Bench t shirt or something from back yeah. at that time. Yeah, like <laughs> ICO Bench t shirt or something. Yeah. I wonder what happened to them. I haven't really been into it since then. So, I did see, I did see at a conference a couple of years ago that somebody had like a like a, it was like a MAGA hat, but it says like "Make ICOs Great Again," and I was like, "Yeah, I'm that's a, I, like that." All right, like I, I appreciate the audacity of that. Yeah, know? the concept <laughs> of ICOs is still strong, but the only problem is that it's it's almost a reverse exit. Is that uh, a lot of the founders you get the money up front, so it almost, it you know I didn't notice at the time because I, we, it was it was in the middle of the moment, but after a lot of reflection and looking back, I realized that that model. Uh, needed more regulation or something because the founders got the money up front. They had very little incentive to build anything. Yeah. Like yeah. they already had, they already had a, you know, hundred million dollars. Like they, they would go, you know, have vacations, they could buy everything they wanted. And so what's the incentive to build something great? There's no really incentive unless you really are passionate about what you do. And that's not a lot of people that are passionate like that. So that's where the failure of ICOs came, I believe. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, do you want to pontificate about ICOs? No, no, go for it. I was gonna pivot. <laughs> okay, okay, yeah. Maybe we should talk about something less polemic. But uh, <laughs> well, you know. I was gonna say, um, you know, now you've been in the scene for uh, at least three rodeos, maybe even more. I've been in it for three, three, yeah. Um, and how did that sort of shape what you're branding yourself now as a futurist? Uh, it, it, the first, uh, and I, I got encrypt uh, Bitcoin in 2011. The first crash was in 2013. I, I got into Bitcoin at $80 and saw it go up to $1,000. Uh, and, and, you know, I was a college student. I was in my late 20s. Uh, I really wasn't wise yet in the world, uh, especially in financial, you know, how, finan how finances work, how markets work, none of that. So uh, when it did crash, I thought it was over. Uh, it was because of MT Gox, Mount Gox, uh, it failed. So I thought Bitcoin was insecure. If they, if they hacked their database, this thing can't be secure. I sold everything I had and I forgot about it for a year or two. Just completely forgot about it. And then, then, then I started seeing it come back, like in 2016 and 17, after the 16 halving. And I, and I thought about it, I said, why is it coming back? I thought this was over. Everybody told me it was a scam. And so that's what caused me to start researching how markets move and how there's four different phases of every, uh, every cycle. There's accumulation markup distribution and markdown and how what what happens in those phases and how uh, psychology affects how humans move within that those four uh, phases of the cycle and I started to realize is that this is true in every single market in stocks in uh, in real estate in certain in most areas and in crypto is that there's an up and down uh, almost like there's an up and down pattern 
it repeats itself over a certain time periods, and it just goes on and on and on. And the unsavvy investor always comes in at the peak, and they lose money on the downtrend. And they panic and sell everything, and they forget about it like I did the first time. And I promised myself I would never do that again. So I started researching it more, understood it, and went all in on Bitcoin and crypto and Ethereum too in 2017. And it's been the best thing ever in my life that, I, you know, that I've done. And then, so how are you spending most of your time nowadays, right? We're uh, obviously, you know, eight years removed from, from the, uh, you know, the Ethereum ICO and all that kind of stuff. But like, uh, but we've got, uh, you know, kind of a, you know, sort of a paradigm shift on our hands now, I think, here with some of these networks starting to really go live and get traction. I mean, Ethereum's obviously been, uh, you know, pretty successful. You even have, uh, like, like Bitcoin, or obviously at a Bitcoin conference, not going anywhere, right? Like, yeah, you know, yeah. like things are, things are kind of like trending in the direction that like the Bitcoiner crowd said it would, you know, 15 years ago. Like we're going, yeah. like, um, and we're getting a lot of other interesting uh, kind of convergences around, uh, you know, things like deep in decentralized physical infrastructure. We're getting a lot of things happening with like, you know, I think AI is moving really quickly and there's a lot of interesting use cases emerging for how, you know, blockchains and AI can potentially interact or like what, what, what might be the play there as far as how these things can sort of like work together or mitigate the risks that one each, each other carries individually, whatever. Uh, anyway, would love your kind of thoughts on like, you know, how are you kind of positioning, uh, you know, uh, like how are you spending your time right now? What are your kind of your core theses right now? Uh, yeah, so uh, actually that was my talk yesterday. Uh, it was on uh, the merge of uh, AI and blockchain. And I really strongly believe that that's the future. Uh, and, and the thing about Bitcoin, uh, we're at a Bitcoin conference, there's a lot of people here, but the honest truth about every cryptocurrency, not just Bitcoin, is that there's no real use case that's being you, you know, where, where this cryptocurrency is being used on a large scale, it's almost all speculation, you know, and speculation is not a bad word. It just means that people are, can see the future, they can see the potential, they can see the applications, and they invest in it. That's all a Bitcoin is right now. But there's a lot of future potential, you know, in the next 5, 10, even 15 years. And AI, I believe, is going to be the driver of that, right? Is that the thing about blockchain technology or Bitcoin and every other crypto, most every other crypto, is that blockchain is, is one of the most transformative databases that we've ever seen. But in reality, it's a database. It stores data. It can make sure the data is secure, transparent, and uh, immutable, right? And there's no way we can lose that data because of the decentralized nation of blockchain. So it's one of it's the most transformative blockchain I mean database we've ever seen, but it lacks intelligence. And most you know, so AI can come into blockchain and give it the intelligence that blockchain needs in order to be very successful. And I think that's the next step. That's the killer app. That's what we've been looking for with blockchain technology is the addition of AI on top of blockchain. And those two together can take blockchain to places we couldn't even imagine. Can you walk through a specific example of what you think is the, the most bullish use case of AI in the in blockchain? I'll give you a good example that I always tell people is that uh, AI models, uh, there's different models that do different things and they can do it extraordinarily well, more than a, a team of thousands of humans can do it. And I'm gonna give you a, a pretty common scenario that I use a lot is that a call center, right? Right now we use humans for call centers, right? So if I need help with my phone, I call somebody. Somebody picks up the phone, walks me through the help. But that, that's very costly. You have human labor. So if we created an AI model that could do that, we're going to replace a lot of jobs. That's what people are afraid of. But what if these models allowed uh, themselves to be tokenized? So I can buy a piece of this model and say, well, whatever this model does revenue-wise, I can get a piece back through the blockchain. So you can, uh, models can now be assets and securities that we can invest in, like a model for a call center, a model for, let's say, credit scores, or a model for, uh, you know, whatever we want, whatever we have to do in society, they can be AI models that are tokenized and we can invest. That's one of the paths that I see to universal basic income, is through, you know, tokenizing these AI models, allowing small investors or any investor to get involved and receive income based on what those models do or produce. One, one area that I've been kind of thinking about recently, like kind of like AI blockchain interaction that I haven't really heard anybody else really talk about. I don't know if it's because I'm, maybe I'm just like crazy, but um, but you see with, with, you know, with like, I mean, we, we went through a big like DAO phase a couple of years ago, like everyone's starting DAOs and like DAOs are trying to like buy the constitution of the United States and like all this kind of crazy stuff, right? Like they have their own treasuries and all these things. And when I was thinking of like, I mean, you can even apply this to, to like, a, not necessarily a DAO, but like maybe even like a protocol as well, like where, 
you know, protocols have their own like, inflation rates, and sometimes things kind of go out of whack when like the protocol's minting more coins than there is like actual demand for the coins, and then like the supply gets all crazy, and there's some crazy inflation, and like it has impacts on the price. So like, what if you had like a, uh, you know, pretty, like a system where you basically have like an AI that's basically like managing like the protocol, like treasury or something like that, right? Where like, okay, you agree on it, like you have like a, a DAO that's like, you know, a constitution for like how this DAO is going to be governed. And then, you know, basically the issuance of the tokens and like the, the supply, the, like the inflation curve and everything uh, is all going to be sort of managed by this AI built on like the principles that are, we've kind of told it like what to do, right? Like we want, you know, whatever, how, whatever criteria we decide on. Um, and you could say that for like even for like a you know a, like any, a, any like regular protocol as well where um, like okay like Ethereum is like you know EIP one five five nine is like it's becoming too deflationary it's like not healthy for the network and then instead of having like a big you know a bunch of people fighting on Twitter about it like the AI is just responsible for like okay well we're just gonna make a couple tweaks here a couple tweaks there we're gonna get it back to where like it's supposed to be you know um, anyway that's just something I was thinking about where it's like because that it kind of you know, it's, it seems like the governance is always like the most painful part in a lot of yeah, these projects. Yeah, and like, exactly. if you can kind of just like, hey, we're just going to agree on a set of principles. And, you know, if we need to have like a constitutional convention, like revise the principles, sure. But like, we're going to hand these principles over to the AI and like, just like, trust that it's not going to yeah, fuck it up. You know? Yeah, that's a, that, that's a great application for DAOs. And that's one thing I think, I think that could take DAOs to the next level because governance is a huge problem, right? And I'm going to say this in the most frank way. Humans are stupid. You know, we're controlled by biases. We're controlled by emotions. One day you may make one decision today and the next day make a completely different decision based on who you're dating, what you saw on TV, you know, and actually be passionate about that decision. AI is not encumbered by that. So if you use, use an AI system to manage or govern a DAO, yeah, I think it would be much more efficient. And then people can buy part of that DAO and they can receive, uh, you know, profits from what the DAO produces or what the AI and the DAO together produces. I've always said for years that I think that's what's going to take DAOs too. Uh, it's going to bring DAOs back into the mainstream. And that's what could take DAOs to the next level. And then we've got to wrap it up here. But um, really quick, just want any final thoughts. And then how can folks find you or follow your content or uh, follow more of your work? Uh, yeah, so the final thought is just that uh, just make sure you're very paid close attention to the next three or four years because I strongly believe that blockchain is going to change exponentially. Like, uh, and that's what happens to a lot of techn technology trends is that one day we are talking about it, the next day it's everywhere, integrated in all systems. The people are like, what happened? Because it's an exponential growth curve. Adoption normally follows that curve. And make sure you're ready for the transform transformative uh, things that are going to happen over the next years when it comes to AI and blockchain. You can find me on any social media platform. I'm Tall Guy Tycoon, T A L L G U Y T Y uh, C O O N. Uh, on Twitter, there's an underscore before that. So, cool. Uh, well, great. Well, thanks so much, Armando, uh, for coming on the show. And I uh, also want to give a shout out to our sponsor, uh, Zappo Bank, for sponsoring the segment. Big shout out to them. Go check them out. And uh, we will be back uh, shortly.